Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for that warm welcome and for inviting me to be a part of this exciting day. Um, when, when Danny and I talked originally about the fact that I was going to be in Australia at this time, um, and he had said, well, maybe you could come up to this colloquium, it sounded like a wonderful opportunity. At that time, I didn't actually know what the title of the colloquium was really about in terms of the interdisciplinary perspective. So it was a bit fortuitous in some ways because what I'm going to talk today about really comes from a very interdisciplinary collaborative research project that we have ongoing, which fits really well with the theme of what's going on today, but also that interdisciplinary approach. So, um, I'm going to talk today about a specific project and I must acknowledge some of my colleagues who've been involved in helping with this data and the data collection that I'm going to present to you today. Um, and we have some things ongoing that I'd be really happy to talk about after the fact. So a colleague at uh, Mount Royal University, David Legg in Canada, and then two of my colleagues at the University of West Scotland who are in uh, the Department of Media and Creative Cultures, um, David McGilvery and Gail McPherson. So they've been heavily involved. And that just gives you a little snap shot of the fact that this group is actually quite interdisciplinary. I also employ um, a psychologist who's done some of our data analysis as well. So I'm going to talk about the context of leveraging events for social inclusion. I'm going to go into that word leveraging a little bit, pull it apart, and then acknowledge that in actual fact, what we've done hasn't actually been looking only at leveraging. We've been looking at multiple aspects of leveraging impacts and legacy. Um, so to begin with, let's talk a little bit about the context of legacy. That sort of this catch-all term now, we hear it all the time. Every time an event is coming, there's the politicians like to pull out that word legacy. It's going to be wonderful for the community. There's going to be all these wonderful things left over, infrastructure, sporting opportunities. In other words, what we're seeing is it being this overly positive emphasis of what happens when an event comes to town. But in actual fact, the reality is we know very little about what those positive outcomes are. We know probably a lot more about what the negative outcomes are for many of the communities. So legacy tends to be viewed predominantly in a positive light um, as this sort of afterthought. And anything, anything and everything that's left over is that legacy. Well, that becomes quite problematic from many perspectives because it's not really addressing a central core issue about hosting events, is that why do we want to have these here and what could the outcomes possibly be? So we, I pull, and I use this quote all the time from one of your illustrious colleagues, Dr. O'Brien, and it really centralizes the key to what we're looking at in terms of the research and the research process. So we are moving a little bit away from legacy, although we can't leave it because it is the rhetoric of organizing committees. It's what they love to hear about. But we're really more focused on the concept of impact, so how it actually is impacting communities, community development issues, some economic related issues. But really key to what I'm interested in is this concept of leveraging, in particular strategic leverage. So in other words, what we actually do with the kinds of resources brought in by an event in order to affect particular outcomes. When I first started my research on events, I focused primarily on urban development and urban regimes was my primary area of research. And after doing that research, I really came up with, well, cities shouldn't host events. They're actually pretty bad for them. They don't really offer a lot economically. It's probably not very good politically. There are all these other outcomes. So as I took a step back from that and started to look broader at the landscape, that's where the concept of leveraging was beginning to become important in the scholarly literature. And it allows us to think about a more strategic way to affect particular outcomes. So that's my interest. In two particular ways, what I'm interested in looking at is the ways in which events with that seed capital, that opportunity, can increase accessibility in communities, so broad-based accessibility, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And in particular, the second issue is increasing opportunities for participation. So those are two really broad categories. What do we mean by accessibility? What do we mean by opportunities for participation? Well, I'm particularly interested in disability sport and disability events. I came upon that sort of as a after thought, really, I was asked to do a keynote talk at a Canadian Paralympic Committee conference and I thought, 
I don't really know much about that, but after I got there and we started talking, there was a lot of really interesting issues. In the realm of disability sport and events, there's been almost no, liter no scholarly literature, no empirical evidence to support any of the claims that are being made about what events can and should be doing in communities. We think when we host an event, it's going to be more accessible for individuals with disabilities, more accessible for kids to participate in, in sport and participation opportunities. But in actual fact, we have almost no evidence to support those claims. So that's what we sought to do. So we took back to the baseline of where does this emphasis come from. So in the context of disability sport and the disability research literature, we draw from the UN Convention. And it's a very important piece of documentation that is the first time that really acknowledges the rights of persons with disabilities. But I want to draw your attention to this particular section. Because in, that, in fact, it actually is indicated, and colleagues of ours in sport management were actually integral in making sure this was part of this um, convention, to include equal bases in community life, which includes recreational, leisure, and sporting activities. So it actually is part of the convention. So something that we all, as signatories to that convention, should actually be doing in our communities. But when we started to look more into the literature about what had actually been done in this realm, and we did a research synthesis back in 2013, we found that there was almost no literature and no empirical evidence to support the claims that these events or sport in general could present these new opportunities. So that led us to think a little bit about why. Why are people not participating, not only in sport and physical activity, but more broadly in community? And um, DePaul has written a lot about the context of barriers and constraints to participation for individuals with disability, and they are numerous. But what we did is sort of look at those and then begin to highlight, okay, well, what is the possibility of a sporting event coming? What could we actually tap into in terms of resources strategically in order to create new opportunities? So from a long list of barriers that prevent people from participating, we highlight a couple of them. One is the limited opportunities. Right now, we tend to see that there's limited opportunities for participation, programs, training, competition. Um, in many areas around the world, there's a significant lack of accessible facilities, limited accessible transportation. So three key areas that, in fact, events probably can tap into. Additionally, there's also a significant lack of understanding and awareness about how to have broad-based social inclusion. Typically, what we were finding is programs were really good about one area and not another and not really understanding how to do that. So we wanted to look at what an event can do and what they are doing in order to create some new opportunities for people to participate, new accessible infrastructure, broad-based issues in the community. And we draw from these four specific objectives. So you're probably aware that when a host city decides to host the Olympic and Paralympic Games, now is part of the bid process, they need to say, what's the legacy going to be? So what's the outcome going to be for their particular community? It needs to be written into the bid process, and now it needs to be measured. The social impact needs to be measured, measured with something called the Olympic Games Impact Assessment. And there are a number of indicators. But the IOC doesn't mandate to a city, you need to have these particular outcomes. That's up to the community to make that decision. While the IPC, the International Paralympic Committee, is very specific about what those outcomes should look like. And they are these four. First of all, there should be an increase in accessible infrastructure, particularly the sporting structures and the overall urban environment. So really broad, lofty goals. Um, there needs to be a development of sport structures and sport organizations that can facilitate opportunities for participation in physical activity all the way up to high performance sport. The third one, a big one, we need to change people's attitudes and perception about disability. And as well, just to add to that, as well as change the position and capabilities of individuals with disability in the broader society. So some pretty lofty goals. And let's not forget to create even more opportunities for those with impairments to become fully integrated into life. So 
four really big lofty goals that are put forward by the International Paralympic Committee. So any event that is uh, governed by or has a connection with IPC then has to put in their bid document and then create some sort of outcomes associated with these four objectives. The interesting thing is when we went to IPC and said, so how is this going? How's it working? And they're kind of going, well, we haven't really done anything. We haven't measured anything. So they don't really know if any of it's happening. So that was good and it was bad for us because we were really interested in the strategic leveraging perspective. But what it made us say is actually we needed to take a step back. And our first step really is to find out, is anything happening? Are they doing anything? And what is the outcome of those things that they are doing? before we can begin that next step. So that led us to think about how we frame this. And I'm not going to talk much about the theoretical framing of it, but I want you to know that underlying our, the lens of our research is a very critical perspective um, centered on something called critical disability theory. And really, we're looking at um, the exclusionary structures and the economic structures which disempower individuals from participating. And you'll see as I talk about the results of the study that we've done, we follow these four areas, um, social supports, information, physical infrastructure, and attitude. So those are the key, four key pillars of critical disability theory. Okay, so let's talk about the study. So this is a, a very large study that's been ongoing for several years, um, and we're still finalizing the data collection. We've still got massive amounts of data. I'm gonna show you what data we've collected in a minute, and um, it's a bit overwhelming. But centrally, our objectives were to look at different forms of hosting events. And this is also a critical piece. And I'm not sure how many are familiar with the realm of um, disability sport or parasport, but there is quite a distinction and um, a very emotional sentiment to whether an event should be integrated, so where athletes with a disability compete as part of the main sporting program, so I, I earlier showed a picture of Chantal Petitclerc. She's one of our, um, you know, decorated national or decorated Paralympians. She is all about everything should be integrated. We should all be integrated. It should be all about that. There is another camp on the other side that says, you know what, we're we're not ready for that. We need separate and distinct. We need to make sure support services are in place. That there's appropriate media attention. That we get. You know, we get our time in the spotlight, and so let's continue to have separate events. But both of those ideologies really come from an emotional sentiment, um, but not really any evidence to support why one model over the other might offer a better outcome or different outcome. So that was part of our objective is to look at that. So we're looking at social legacy tactics or sort of leveraging strategies, programs, also, one of the things that we then were asked by IPC to do is if you're really interested in this thing that they keep saying we're going to change everybody's attitude and their awareness and their understanding of disability, let's actually look at that. So I'm going to talk about those two particular pieces today in terms of what we've done. I've separated them out completely for the events we're looking at just so we can talk a little bit about what the meaning of those might be if we think about it from a leveraging perspective. So let's talk about the events, and these are really pertinent right now, considering what you've got upcoming in a couple of years here in the Gold Coast. Um, the two events under study were the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. And as you probably know, the Commonwealth Games is the only international integrated event, so where athletes with a disability compete as part of the main sporting program. So integrated in all aspects of the event. The host city is allowed to choose additional sports to add to the program, but typically there are five sports that have been part of the program, four up until Glasgow, and then another one was added. Athletics, swimming, powerlifting, bowls, and track cycling. Okay? So those are typically the sports that we've seen in the Commonwealth Games as being integrated into the program. For the Commonwealth Games, they termed everything about legacy, and legacy was a general planning process. So I want you to just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as I talk about the results a little bit. We then also studied the 2015 Pan Para Pan American Games, and you may not as be may not be as familiar with that event. Obviously, you all don't participate in it, um, but it is of the Americas. It's a it's a very sizable event 
15 para sports are part of that event. Um, and it is done as the Olympic and Paralympic model. So separated by time and space. So there's a 10 day window in between when the Pan Am Games finish and then the Para Pan Am Games start up and it's the next event. So that was really important for us to have those two different types of events to look at. Okay, so I'm not gonna leave this up there long because it gives me a little bit of a heart attack every time I do, um, but gives you a little bit of an idea of the amount of data that we've collected and a little bit of the pieces all over the place that we're working through and sifting through. Um, we were very fortunate to work quite closely with both um, Glasgow 2014 and Toronto 2015 in terms of getting access to the events. We were on site during the games for observations, which is actually quite critical to some of the things that we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about. Um, we are also on site um, in the mile. There's always, a, I'm not sure if you know that in an event, there's always a mile cordoned off area where no sponsors or surveys or anything like that is allowed to be other than the official sponsors and official groups. So we were allowed to be in that area to conduct our surveys. We had great access to government officials, uh, members of the organizing committee, and they've worked really well. Um, because the games are also governed by the International Paralympic Committee, you have to go through a process to get sanctioned by the International Paralympic Committee to also be on site. So we've been working quite closely with them as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what all that means and what did we find. As I said, we had originally set out to look at leveraging strategies and tactics, but as we got into it, we recognized some of the individuals understood what that meant and where to go with it, others didn't. So it's kind of a melding between legacy impact and leveraging, what I'm gonna to present today. So for Glasgow, how many of you know, when did the first time Olympic and Paralympic Games become an integrated organizing committee? Anybody know when that happened? It was in Australia. It was in Sydney, yeah. So in Sydney, after Sydney 2000, they decided that it would make sense if we're holding a games together to have an integrated organizing committee. Since that time, major events have decided to do the same thing, so Commonwealth Games, Pan, Para, Pan Am Games. It's a really interesting idea, and I think, again, philosophically, it makes a lot of sense. We certainly saw some very interesting things with using an integrated organizing committee. So for example, there was, an inter there was complete integrated messaging, and the media and marketing managers for the Glasgow Commonwealth Games talked extensively about how inclusive it was, how everything we did was about advancing a particular agenda of participation. We want everybody to participate. It, no athletes with a disability were represented in any of the media or marketing strategies. They were rarely, repre rarely represented in the media at all, um, unless they won a medal, and that was only two athletes that won a medal. Um, and the broad objective in terms of what they wanted to see those strategic outcomes look like did not include anything related to disability or disability sport. They really had very little resources associated with anything uh, about disability sport. The only thing that they did do, which is an interesting commentary, was, and something that um, we've actually, we actually talked to um, the Gold Coast 2018 a little bit about early on in our discussions with them, is the sports that they chose. They added powerlifting to it. So what did the Scottish government do? They decided, well, we're going to put a whole bunch of money into powerlifting to, develop, to make sure that we have powerlifting athletes, so athletes with a disability, at the games. And they succeeded, they had one athlete with it that was there, Mickey Yule, he did wonderful, it was great showcase. The problem being that, that re those resources actually were taken away from existing disability sport programs in order to put into the high performance program. And now currently there are only four clubs in Scotland that actually have any powerlifting at all, and only seven athletes that are actually participating at a relatively high performance level. So again, those are some of the things that happen with an event. For Toronto, again, we have an integrated OC. Um, very interesting in this particular case with the organizing committee. Um, they were very conscious of making sure that they had the message out about this being also a para event. So they used para athletes whenever possible in the messaging. And the media and marketing manager, and every time I 
think about the interview that we had, it was just she said all those words that you didn't want to hear. It's so easy to use those para-athletes. They have so much free time. They just have wonderful heroic stories of all the things that they've overcome. So they did the opposite. They went in the opposite direction and failed to acknowledge the importance of thinking about inclusion in order to create more opportunities. Um, so there was some really problematic things that happened there. However, for the para games, what they decided to do is they actually recognized that an organizing committee can't do legacy. They, they basically said, we got to run the games. It's, it's not up, up to us to do that. Here, you go and do that. Gave it over to the um, national organization responsible for para sport and the provincial organization that ended up creating a separate governing body um, to actually develop the legacy outcomes from the event. And that partnership group is ongoing. So they started pre-games, I was involved, I sat at the table with them from the outcome, and they're actually using the event to strategically create particular outcomes that are almost completely divorced from the event, but it was enabled by the event. So it's a really interesting piece in terms of what that looks like for what leveraging tactics should be about. So some really interesting things. So at the outset of both games, when they put in their bids, they said, we're going to have these great outcomes in terms of legacy, more people participating, more accessible facilities, lots of programming for people with disabilities. The problem is, is those policy objectives, those ideas, didn't really turn into any concrete strategies except for possibly in the Toronto case, and we're still following what's actually happening with that group. So I can tell you they're working on things, but that's going to take many years to come to fruition. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each games and some of the things that um, we've learned in terms of governance, delivery, and then talk a little bit about the attitudes piece, because it's really interesting to think about in terms of the strategic objectives. So. Um, for Glasgow 2014, and something for the Gold Coast to be considering as well, there was a real emphasis on quantity and quality of para sports, but a real marginalization of athletes. In other words, we're going to showcase the highest level of sport performance, therefore it means the lowest level of disability. So therefore, individuals with more severe disabilities were excluded from the games entirely. Um, the organizing committee demonstrated very much a centralized approach. They didn't want to give over those opportunities for other groups to do strategic things to create outcomes. Um, they thought they had foregrounded inclusion and equality, but certainly they also recognize that when they're gone, when the games are over, they liquidate, they wrap up, they move on. So there was kind of an irony because they knew they were supposed to be doing something to create particular outcomes, but they didn't actually do anything to affect those outcomes. Um, there is a group now that has taken up that effort and they are from the Scottish government that is moving some of the agendas forward. But, you know, when you say we're all about accessibility and inclusion and you're on site at the games and you're going, OK, well, what if I'm hearing impaired or if I'm, what if I'm visually impaired? They've got these great devices for you that none of them worked. And these signs that you could get everywhere, right? Everybody read where you can get to the velodrome. So, Again, it's the little details like that when you're talking about a games that are about accessibility and inclusion that need to be thought through. And they may seem minor, but they're really important. Um, and when we were on site, some of the things that we have to think about from a social inclusion perspective is the ways in which that inclusion is represented. Absolutely, the games were exemplary in terms of accessibility. But take a look at this top venue, right? This one, this one right here, uh, oops. This one right here, that's at swimming. So you see how there's a barrier uh, there and then individuals who ha have accessibility needs sit in front of that barrier at pool height, which means you can't actually see the race, you don't get to sit with your family, you're not actually included. So if you're really thinking about a games being about inclusion, you need to think about the opportunity of that. Um, people didn't think that was a big issue. They saw it. because as something that had happened. Ah, oh, that happened in London. We know it's like that. They were really knowledgeable about the sport, so they didn't feel they needed a lot of information about the sports. Um, and that might be a result of London 2012. I don't know whether the Gold Coast is using the system like this. This is the, I'm not sure if anybody remembers this from London 2012. This is the Lexi classification system. 
So when a para sport comes up, so you're watching swimming and it's part of the program and all of a sudden there'll be an event that's a para event, so a disability event. And as a spectator, you're going, okay, what's, what's going on? So in Glasgow, they use the Calexi classification system, which is owned by Channel 4. Um, so they rented it for a very a large amount of money. Um, so that spectators would at least know what the event is about. So they gave them some knowledge. And knowledge is very critical if you're going to then create particular outcomes about sporting opportunities. So it was a good start, but they didn't do anything with it. There was no information about the sports, nothing else going on about where you could get involved or how to get involved or anything like that. Um, and so they really missed that opportunity. And I talked about the case of Mickey Ewell already, about how the, the sports that were chosen didn't really map on to the local context. So even when now they're trying to think about, well, what could we do? What could we leverage off that? The, they actually don't map well onto what's actually happening in the community, so it's really hard to create those opportunities. And this one, I think this quote is wonderful because it, it really shows that disconnect between what happens with the sport infrastructure and the urban environment. Um, and this woman was at the games. Um, we, were, we were on social media quite a bit during the games. She was tweeting at us during the games about her experiences and, and she had come to us and wanted to be interviewed and she ended up being interviewed in the Sunday Times about the fact that this beautiful brand new facility, completely accessible everywhere you go, wonderful to get around and then you go outside to try and get on the bus and you can't. It's impossible. So, Again, the event effect needs to be considering, if we're going to make this accessible opportunities, it needs to go beyond that border. So that requires quite a strategic partnering. And Glasgow wasn't quite there yet in terms of that partnership approach. So let's talk about Toronto 2015. And, I, and I'm going to say that a lot of the results from this are still a bit preliminary. It was in August in 2015 that we collected this data. So we're collecting it from all of our different sources. Um, here it was really on the, uh, the emphasis on the quality and quantity of the sports. 15 para sports was more than had ever been represented at the Para Pan Am Games. So it was a really big event from that perspective. Um, and this is a really interesting tying of a policy perspective and a strategic objective by the organizing committee. In Ontario, we have an act called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities. And that act says that by 2025, all public services, everything service oriented, including infrastructure and anything related to services, needs to be fully accessible. So the organizing committee took it upon themselves to do full accessibility audits of the 15 facilities that were going to be used. And that included training facilities, advanced facilities for those teams coming from outside the country to ensure that they were up to, you know, up to par and then handed those over to the facility managers and said, we will partner with you, we'll give you a third of the resources for you to get up to the AODA standards. Only one facility took them up on that offer, um, which was, I was quite surprised by that. I guess maybe not in some respects because it is a financial burden, but they have to do that by 2025. So we're getting kind of closer to that point. It would have been a great opportunity to leverage the event to get those resources to do that. So unfortunately, many of them didn't, despite the fact that the Accessibility, and Advis Accessibility Council and Advisory and Integration said, this is something you should do and you need to do. The provincial government even was willing to step up and help with that, and they, they didn't. Um, and because they really believe from the organizing committee level, it will be fine. Don't worry, we're all about equity, accessibility, and inclusion. I'm not going to talk about the politics of the Pan Am Games because there was a lot of change in leadership and a lot of things going on which made getting any information from the organizing committee that was factual a little bit difficult. Um, but one of the things, if you've ever been to Toronto, I don't know if anybody's been to, been to Toronto before, uh, it is massive. It is stretched out so far geographically, which meant the venues were extremely far from one another. Um, and that from a accessibility perspective was very problematic. And that's one of the things that's actually held up the um, partnership group that's trying to create new opportunities from actually developing new outcomes. They have very specific targets on participation, 
coaching um, for disability and some governance structures. But the main thing that's holding up us moving forward with those strategic objectives is the geographic distance and the municipal infrastructure. So it's all different municipalities. So trying to work together has been somewhat problematic for this group. So here they actually thought about it, which is really good. There's some really good ideas, but they haven't quite got there yet. Um, this is a really interesting piece, and it goes back to something that um, some colleagues of mine wrote about before, about information and communication related to event outcomes. Um, we have these ideas that there's going to be these particular outcomes. As a member of the public, we're going to have this great event, and all these wonderful things are going to happen for us. Um, and events responsibility is to sort of manage those expectations. What can an event do versus what you think an event can do? Um, and they didn't do a very good job, particularly in relation to some of the opportunities. This happened at PAN and Parapan. We have all these great new facilities and people thought, that's great, we can go and access them. Most of them are now private facilities and most of them are high performance facilities. From a para perspective, from a disability perspective, one of the things that's really problematic in that realm is that people just don't know about sports. They don't even know what they are, let alone where to access them. So, they really missed out on that opportunity. And we're walking around on site and we have our purple, Western's purple, we have our purple Parasport researchers t-shirts on. So people are coming up to us and saying, where can I find out about that sport? Where can I actually go and play that? And thinking like, what a huge missed opportunity to be able to tap into that. The second thing that was really problematic, they didn't use the Lexi classification system. So when we were in the stands at swimming and there would be a, an event coming on, and I don't know if you've watched much parasport before, if you watch swimming, and there's a classic one in the event, that come, so swimming is a really interesting one. So I'm sitting there and there's spectators all around. And so first of all, two individuals of short stature come out. And then another woman who is about six foot four, and no visible disability, no physical, visible physical disability. Another individual behind that with um, an arm amputation and a leg amputation, and then another individual with an arm amputation. And the, you could tell the spectator around me are going, what is, go that is so unfair, because there was no information about how the classification system works. Because in actual fact, it's not just purely the disability, it's the combination of the disability with the activity but no information about that. So spectators were completely lost. So if we're going to move from just having that awe factor, wow, there's people participating, to having them engage and then become fans, we need to be giving them more information. And that's actually something we've been working with the International Paralympic Committee on, because I think they are beginning to recognize they've moved beyond just the awe factor of disability sport to really needing to think about what that means. And that leads us to thinking about the concept of attitudes. Because if people are more interested in the sport itself, something's going on with attitudes and perceptions as well. When we started out, and I'm not going to show you a lot of it because the surveys, as you can tell, lots and lots and lots of data to distill. I'm only going to tell you a little bit of information. But the attitudes piece is important for us. And it's important because we make an assumption that we're going to host a disability sport event it's going to change your attitude about disability. You're going to understand more about the barriers to participation. So you have all these change in perception. So we used a measure called a scale of attitude towards disability. Extremely controversial survey. And it asked very um, personal and, and controversial questions purposefully to try and elicit an emotional reaction. Um, certainly with that, we have a possibility of a social desirability bias. But we have um, a large number of surveys completed. You can see what we've got, pre and post surveys of volunteers and on-site with spectators to give us some idea of the IPC's big grandiose statement that if you just watch Parasport, you're going to feel better, you're going to understand disability better. Um, so does it have an attitude? On volunteers for the Commonwealth Games, we can see pre and post. We looked at awareness about disability global attitude towards disability, and then attitude towards parasport. Um, and there is a significant difference pre and post for awareness and global attitudes. So, you know, that sounds good, but 
I think we need to be cautious about that because we're talking about on a seven point scale, global attitude going from 5.8 to 5.94. So we're not talking about huge differences in reality that looks big because we have lar a very large sample size. So we want to be a bit cautious about making the claim that it does have that impact. And we're also starting with people with pretty high attitudes towards disability. The second piece in Toronto, a little bit lower attitude generally, a little bit lower levels of awareness. Um, and here we actually saw no significant differences pre and post. So in this case, um, the games didn't really have an effect. Awareness looks like it does, but again, that's just because of the numbers. Um, and then we have very large number of sample size, so there isn't any significant effect there. Um, so our spectators, you can't measure spectator attitude pre and post. It's really prohibitive to get access to spectators anyways, let alone pre and post. So we were only able to do it on site. So the scale's a little bit different, but it asks specific questions about um, their attitudes and awareness in the same way. Um, and these are the comparisons of Glasgow 2014 and Toronto 2015. Again, we saw a little bit of a difference between those two events for awareness and global attitudes. But again, we're still talking about really large samples with really high attitude measures. So someone measuring at a 5.7 on a seven point scale isn't, that's probably not that problematic. Um, this is the interesting one that the IPC asked us to include. And if you do stat stuff, you'll, you can, grill me after and pull it apart. Well, actually, don't. I'll, I'll send you to my statistician. But they asked us to ask if the event has changed your attitude um, towards disability. And the interesting thing I can tell you about that is I'm primarily a qualitative researcher. So my surveyors are coming back to me and going, yeah, but they don't know how to answer this question because they're like, well, actually, it's already good. So it hasn't really changed my attitude. But I don't want to say no because then it looks like I'm, it's bad. So, so, there was some con so clearly, there's some confusion in that. Um, so, but IPC was excited to see that, at least in Toronto, with that event, there was a greater number of individuals who indicated that it did change their attitude towards disability. Maybe that's, uh, there's something in that, and I think it's something that we need to pull apart a little bit more. Just recently, um, we have pulled that apart a little bit more. We've got a number of measures that look at some of those things. And what it's showing us is there is a greater impact on that attitude measure and a greater impact on the attitude towards disability for the 2015 event, so the separate and distinct event, which would seem logical because you are actually going and seeing the disability sport event versus it just being in part of the mix and you may or may not actually have watched a disability event. Um, so what does that tell us? Um, I think we have to be very cautious about what the attitude measures and awareness tell us, but it gives us at least some initial insights to go back to IPC and saying, stop saying that it's going to change everybody's attitudes unless you're going to do something about it. And I think they're beginning to recognize that while the enthusiasm and the idea of making a particular outcome happen is wonderful, without actually strategically managing those ideas along the way through information, through programming, through specific outcomes, then they're not going to get those results. Um, so we know that events are having some impact on attitude, but again, that's unclear. And really critical um, is that despite the fact that it has an impact on attitude, we have no idea how that's translating into behavior. And that's the key piece that we need to think about how to get at. Um, and that sometimes these big events are so focused on wonderful big facilities and all these great things that they're going to do, that the politicians are going to say they're do, they're forgetting about the really important opportunities to strategically leverage. The things that we've ha heard from people in our post interviews for Glasgow and for 2015 are that, yeah, we should really just done things like a little bit more on the transportation, like the everyday transportation stuff. We should have done some things about coaching. Um, maybe put in place some small programs or something on site so people could have been referred to sport. So some of those, what we call the mundane everyday barriers to participation, actually let's try and address some of those. Pathways, coaching, transportation, pricing issues, equipment related issues, those could be addressed but sometimes they're getting lost in the big scheme of the big event. Um, 
and really critical, something we had not expected to see, um, and perhaps it's the same in the, in the able-bodied realm, but in the disability realm, in both of the events, the biggest barrier to actually leveraging the event, and we're finding this still with Toronto and the outcome, it was there was no capacity to actually create those outcomes. There was no system integration, there was a complete disconnect in the various sectors about who's delivering that sport, is it the NSO or the PSO or what you would call your state organization, is it a disability specific organization, where does the delivery actually happen? So if you're expecting those outcomes to happen, capacity building and system integration is going to be critical in order to affect the para-sport outcomes. So what are we doing next? Where do we go from here? Um, it's one of the, the first that's done a longitudinal study like this. We still have a lot more data to go through. Um, but really, I really, I mean, I know re event researchers have said this for a long time. We need more longitudinal studies. They're hard to do. Um, we only looked at pre and during event. We really now need to look post event because that's where we're going to see some of the potential strategic leveraging activities come to fruition. And so we need to follow those through. We need to assess more about what's happening. And we need to translate that back to the governing bodies. Um, I present back to the Canadian Paralympic Committee on a regular basis and to the International Paralympic Committee. I just presented at the Canadian Paralympic Committee conference and I first thing I said to them, don't hate me, don't throw things, but stop saying you're gonna have these wonderful outcomes from events if you're not going to do anything about it. So if you want to have those outcomes, then you actually need to do something about it. Notice thing was thrown at me, so they were okay with that, but um, just say it's one big hell of a party and let's enjoy it and move on, or actually do something in order to create those particular outcomes you want to see happen. So I think that's something as we as scholars and those in the broader community can start to think about how we make those things actually happen. Thank you.